Financial trouble is like gaining weight. It doesn't happen overnight. It's the slow, additional, like let's say, less favorable decisions. It's eating that additional financial cookie. Have you ever wondered about how we make decisions about our money? Or why we feel the way we do about those decisions? Welcome to Nudging Financial Behavior, the podcast that aims to help you understand how and why you make certain decisions about money. Presented by Dr. Giselle Willows, an expert in behavioral finance. This podcast is all about looking at human behavior and biases, especially when it comes to your finances. You can catch the series on YouTube, the Nudging Financial Behavior blog, or on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to like and subscribe to ensure you don't miss an episode. Special thanks to our sponsor, IG Market South Africa, a world-leading online trading provider that gives you access to opportunities across thousands of financial markets through their intuitive platforms and apps. Let's get started. Welcome to episode 10 of Nudging Financial Behavior. It's going to be a goodie. In this series, it was my goal to help you recognize the biases that can subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, pull or push your thinking into making decisions about your finances that aren't entirely rational. When you're able to recognize these pushes and pulls, you'll be able to make smarter choices about your money and hopefully end up saving and earning more. And we've reached the final episode of season one. Thank you for sticking with me and watching through to the end. I'd like to take this time to recap on everything we've discussed so far. We've gone over several biases. I'd like to make sure that you know how to recognize them. Here's Dr. Daniel Crosby from episode five to give us a refresher on how biases are created. So even though about half owes to genetic factors, there's still almost another half that's within our control and usually much less depends on just sort of what happens to us. So we're not totally in control of these decisions, but we are largely in control and and environmental factors have less of an influence than I think we sometimes think. I've also got some extra footage from each of the interviews we had with our various experts that we spoke to during the season. Of course, I have to let them have the final word and share some of their personal mishaps with money, but also their advice to you. So to begin, to make sure we all know that we've all made mistakes with money, let's hear some stories of bad financial decisions that our guests made. So about 10 years back, I had a very, very good friend and colleague, almost a friend of the family. Um, and he had this absolutely beautiful investment opportunity. Um, it was in the, the sort of power energy drinks and uh, water side, which was very, very, very uh, successful at that point. Very, uh, you know, lots of people were buying this stuff. And he had a very good friend and connection, friends of his family. They had a big business up in Limpopo area and the stuff was flying off the shelf and they needed a Cape Town distributor. So eventually um, I got sold into the story, just sounded too good to be true. And a few weeks later, one ton truck stops outside my door. We physically cleaned up the garage, we cleaned up a bottom flat, and we loaded about one tons of energy drinks and stuff in. Fortunately, I didn't start early enough to get office space and those sort of things because it turned out not to be as great as everybody thought. Um, you know, so, so we had someone employed, they went from shop to shop, but all the stuff that's been told to us wasn't actually quite that true, and eventually it just went south. And fortunately, early enough, I realized this is not it, and I liquidated everything. Uh, sort of sold at an auction and everything kind of ended up okay, except for losing a few ads. Um, and, and I think the moral of the story is, you know, it's kind of, you do fall, fall fail to your, your own mistakes. You know, I always tell clients, do your research, check up stuff, don't believe everybody's opinion. Um, and, and certainly in that case as well, you know, I should have done a bit more research. I shouldn't have just believed the facts blindly. I came across this, what seemed to me like a really amazing, um, investment opportunity, which was essentially you invest in solar panels. Uh, and look, I was 21 at the time, so I invested 500 Rand, which was a lot for me back then. Um, and I invested 500 Rand in these solar panels and I was so moved by it because I was like, yes, solar is the way. Plus it was, you know, you would get Bitcoin back and Bitcoin was like a big buzzword at the time. And I'd made a lot of money in crypto already at this point. So I was like, by chance, by the way. Um, so it's like, everything was ticking my boxes. <laughs> I invested the 500 rand, they promised it wasn't great returns, but I think 
after five years, you were going to get your money back plus 20% or something. So not the world's not going to set the world on fire, but I logged in today so I could give the exact amount. And my investment has made me back 73 Rand and 62 cents, um, which is obviously terrible from like an investment perspective because I've lost, I've lost all my money, Never mind inflation. There's always a balance in everything. So, uh, you know, I can relate to when um, I met my wife and between us, we have five children and um, we needed a home. So we, so we, we, we stretched ourselves and, and bought a home that could um, accommodate everybody. Um, and then um, a couple of years later, we, we, we did an alteration, which again was, you know, um, financially not a great decision. Um, interest rates started to move up and, and everything. Um, and, and when I look back at, at that decision on, and when we eventually sold that home and moved to, to where we are now, uh, financially, we, we, we were in the red. So we, we lost money on that overall deal. So, so financially, that was not a, it wasn't a great experience. However, it was the best thing we ever could have done for the family um, because it, it really created a, a home for, for us and the children. And, uh, and it was actually the place where, where we really built the special bonds that we, that we now enjoy. Um, so that was a bad decision, but there was a, there was a positive side to it as well. <laughs> There's quite a few. I will give you one of the worst financial decisions I made. I got bluffed by a friend. I had known him for 11 years. He was definitely in the startup arena myself and my business partner gave him $250,000 each for him. So if we just quickly add that up, that's half a million dollars. We gave this to our friend and he went over to the Ukraine and spent it all on prostitutes. Now that does buy you quite a few prostitutes, I can guarantee it. But what are my lessons from this? I learned firstly, even if it is a friend asking for money, that you totally do your due diligence. <laughs> I feel like it's safe to say, read the fine print, be careful of giving money to your friends and watch out for property. The first thing I want to go over quickly is the concept of system one and system two thinking. A system one brain thinks fast, using past experiences to create context. It reacts to stimuli, information, sounds, sight, etc., and then looks at experiences you've had to create a response. A system two brain thinks a lot slower, using far more of your body's resources to calculate an accurate answer to a problem. The reason this is important for this discussion is because system one is full of biases that act unconsciously on our decision making. If we're not careful, we can easily make decisions that are irrational, leading to choices about our money that aren't great. Then we got onto the actual biases. In episode six, we discussed overconfidence bias, where we overestimate our skills or our knowledge when making a decision. This bias can be broken into two parts, illusion of knowledge and illusion of control. Both of them have a lot to do with the fact that we don't like uncertainty, and we often try to gain as much information as possible, that's the illusion of knowledge, and then convince ourselves that we have the ability to influence a situation even if we don't. That's the illusion of control. This bias is a real danger to our financial decision making. It's too easy to slip from being confident in a decision to being overconfident. When you're overconfident, you don't take responsibility for failures. So you blame the market when you lose money rather than your bad investment decision. It's so easy to be overconfident that even some of our guests fall prey to this bias. I asked them, have you ever been guilty of overconfidence bias? Here's what some of them had to say. So I bought three shares and they were going up well. And then I got this overconfidence bias kicking in and I also got the gambler's fallacy kicking in that I thought the fourth trade, you know, the first three trades are doing exceptionally well. The fourth trade has to be a winner uh, because of those two biases. I ignored all my good systems and risk management. Um, and that fourth trade actually wiped out all of the th prior three's profits in, in one foul swoop. Uh, as a man, I'm guilty of overconfidence bias every single day of my life. So. Uh, I think there's so many ways. I mean, I think there's times when I've ignored the advice of my financial advisor. Uh, I think there's times when I've overtraded. 
you know, this is one of in, in financial markets, it's one of the ways that that overconfidence uh, rears its ugly head is by trading too much, buying individual stocks. Um, yeah, I've been overconfident many times and I'm sure I will continue to be. Oh, yes, completely. I think it goes part and parcel with being able to be a trader. We do need to summon a certain amount of confidence. I was in the options market and with options, we know they are tricky little things. Things can go very well or not so well. And I wrote a lot of options under a stock called News Corp. And then I went out shopping because I'd made so much money. It was wonderful. And just as I was handing over the credit card for one of my many purchases, I suddenly had the thought, what happens if the market crashes? And I pulled the credit card back before the lady had had a chance to run it through for all of my purchases. And I realized I was about to be up for $800,000 more than I could afford if the worst case scenario came true. I got very interested in uh, a company by the name of Tesla, which I'm sure all of your uh, listeners are very aware of, and uh, invested uh, a bunch of money in options with uh, an expiration date in the future. And I thought I was making a great move um, because I very much believed in, in, um, in, the, uh, in the Tesla story. Um, and I still do believe strongly in the Tesla story, uh, but I failed to anticipate um, demand issues that have arisen recently, which actually caused the stock to crash really hard um, at exactly the wrong time. Um, so that was a bit of a le learning experience for me. I went into that um, overconfident, absolutely. <laughs> See, we all struggle with it. The next bias in episode seven was confirmation bias, where we tend to only look for information or facts that confirm what we already believe. It's quite simple to understand this one. We have a view of the world with opinions on topics and we don't like that to be challenged. Our natural reaction is to seek out information that confirms what we already hold to be true. It's too hard to look at a different point of view because that might mean that we have to change our opinion. How is this potentially bad for your financial decisions? It limits you by preventing you from gathering all the facts before making a decision. If you believe an investment is good before you start your research, you'll cling to information that supports your belief. You could then end up investing in something that isn't that great because you didn't look at all the facts available. I asked our guest financial planners from the season if they could give us any examples of how clients use confirmation bias with them. Probably the most often is a client deciding not to do anything, it having a good outcome. So what often happens here is a client would hold a very big position in one specific share and if that share continues to increase in value, it continues to confirm the fact that they were right. And for me, it goes back to splitting out the decision-making process and the result. The result might be positive, but it doesn't mean the way we got to that answer was a good process. And so that happens time and time again. I think we see it in the cryptocurrency world. We see it in people just doubling down and saying, oh, I'm going to do more of this because look, it's, it's had a positive outcome. Even in the world of results where we say, oh, this has happened so many times. Surely it must be because of skill and it's not because of luck. Well, crypto for a lot of the youth, uh, it's all their mates are doing it. I remember sitting around a uh, a lunch table at Kay and Monty outside Plett years ago with um, my sisters and their families and all their kids. And, and, and they were all, all these youngsters and they were all extremely bright and uh, from actuaries to CAs and everything. But they were, you know, they were all completely blinded by this whole crypto thing. This was the same time that uh, Marcus Joester's, um castle came tumbling down. So, um, so yeah, and and uh, and they they all got involved, and they you know not one of them could explain how this thing worked or you know how it made money. All they knew is that everyone was doing it, all their friends were making money, and and it was going up. So I mean that's that's a real obvious one. In technical analysis, is where people look at patterns, and then uh, they come up with all of these imaginary patterns, like head and shoulders and wedges and. Um, 
a lot of funny things. And based on those patterns, they they believe they've got a, got a confirmed pattern and therefore they've got a reason to either stay in the trade or get into the trade. You know, there's a number of people that believe that um, cost is the only thing that you look at in investments, you know. So, so they would, um, you know, we'd go through detailed plans and analysis and show options and alternatives and, you know, after cost compare this and that. And I've had a number of clients that actually, um, you know, quite a few of them almost discard any information that you provide and they seek out everything that confirms their bias around fees being the only thing that's important in investing. Spotting this bias in yourself can be as easy as looking at your Google search history. If you're already inclined to think that an investment opportunity is good, your research question in the search bar will show it in the way you frame the question. The same goes for when you think that that investment isn't such a good idea. And all that talk about how you frame the question takes us quite nicely onto the next bias on the list, which we discussed in episode 8, the framing effect. This one is all about how we present it with information and how that changes how you feel about that information. Framing is used all the time to help shape our understanding of the world. Some even argue that framing is simply giving you context for a topic or piece of information. And without framing, you wouldn't be able to understand that topic. Framing also happens naturally in our own minds because we look at information based on our past experiences and the knowledge we have on a topic. While it's true that framing isn't necessarily bad, there are some points about framing and the impact it can have on you that we need to be aware of. Marketers use framing all the time to highlight the good and hide the bad. When you say that framing can be used to provide context, that context can be manipulated to make something expensive seem reasonable. Remember the wine list example? So with the first list, we stayed away from the 300 Rand bottle because it seemed too expensive. But with the second list, we choose the 300 Rand bottle. When it comes to investing, Having too narrow a frame can be a very bad thing. A narrow frame means that you only look at a share or investment on its own. You don't look at your whole portfolio or your overall wealth before making a decision to sell or buy. I asked our guest financial planners how they go about viewing their investments, and here's what they had to say. I think we have to focus on the word portfolio and say this should be a collection of things. And if we say that, we need to have a set of guidelines. We need to come up with the rules to say, what am I going to stick to? Like, is there a maximum percentage that I should have in one holding? I think that's a great framework to start with. Is there specific sectors that I'm going to exclude? Is there specific countries that I'm going to include? What are the most common pitfalls? Do I have a home bias? Like those rules to set up to say, okay, now I have a framework to make decisions within my portfolio. But then the challenge comes, you might have this framework and if something falls out of it, will you have the guts to actually stick within that framework? Or are you going to go back and say, oh, hold on, this is an exception and I'm going to change the parameters here to fit into my current portfolio? That's probably a warning sign of that overconfidence bias. So come up with your set of rules, what works for you. Maybe it is, I'm going to have X percentage in active managers and X percentage in passive managers. The, the outcome is less important, but it's figuring out what works for you. Yuster's example is a perfect reason where, you know, you don't invest in one share like Stanoff, you know, and, and when something continues to move up, there are very, very few companies that will continue on that trend you know, forever. There, there are some that have done it for an extremely long time. Um, but if you, if you basically just buying a basket of, you know, the, the, the Googles and all the, the those fantastic uh, companies that are out there that we can access, Apple, um, we know that in the long run, world markets move upwards. You know, there will be temporary, um, temporary downs. Um, in, in fact, I think people don't quite understand. That, that the market drops, I think, 10 or 12% every year from a high. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to remember the big crashes, um, but the market effectively crashes almost on, a, on an annual basis. So one of the things I do personally is when I watch, do a watch list, I, would, if I do not have more than five open positions at any time in terms of number of different shares. 
I also make sure that I, at maximum I have two from a specific sector. So to overcome that, I would not go, you know, I would not have five of the same shares. So even in trading, it's quite important to, to eliminate correlation risk, which is not picking shares of the same sector. And then ideally um, picking shares from different asset classes or different sectors, if you possibly could. I'll take the narrow framing uh, discussion in a little bit of a different direction. One of the things that I try to do to, to avoid narrow framing uh, is to just try and, and remind myself of my why. You know, remind myself why I'm doing this and remind myself the timeline against which I'm doing it. You know, what happens to some individual asset class within a larger portfolio over a short period of time has very little to do with my long term financial freedom. And I find that the best way for me to remember that is to root myself in my values, my why. And for me, that's all about relationships and and freedom. Such great advice. In the previous episode, episode nine, we then looked at anchoring and how completely arbitrary numbers or pieces of information can influence how we value something. An anchor point is actually quite useful in everyday life. It will help you to make estimates and work things out rather than having a wild guess about information. Remember when we worked out pretty well when Einstein must have been born? The problem is that we're too easily influenced by random anchors that we don't even notice the anchors that we cling to because we feel like they make sense. Remember that experiment we did back in episode 9? 9, 9, 9. I want to say 25 rand, but I suspect probably 30 something. Then there's the anchored investor, someone who won't let go of the purchase price they had originally, even though they've made a profit through dividends. It's very difficult to sell stocks for less than the purchase price, even when the bigger picture shows a profit. Anchors are linked to just about every other cognitive bias, so it's really important that you become aware of them and interrogate financial decisions to ensure that you're not clinging to an anchor that isn't actually helping you. Here's what I guess said about being anchored to arbitrary pieces of information when making a decision. The share that comes to mind is Toll Holdings. I remember I was in Toll, it was a big position. I loved that share. It was also everything that I was hoping for in a share because it had the exact same pattern that I had for my archetype. My archetype is the perfect share that I look at to try and match new shares to. So Toll Holdings was eaten a bit. And then I remember looking in the middle of the day, which is not in my trading plan, it had dropped. My baby had fallen out of bed. Oh my gosh, it doesn't deserve to play with the other shares. How dare it? I sold it. And of course, by the end of the day, it had gone right back up. Now, what can we learn from this? Firstly, stick to your trading plan, the ways, for goodness sake. And secondly, be aware that if you are making decisions without a pause, then there is probably a wrong decision about to be made. Add a pause in between your impulse and your action, and then you've got a chance of making a sound, objective, rational decision. A while ago, I bought into this like crypto startup that I was like super interested in. It was um, founded by my stats tutor, who I was like completely enamored with, and I thought he was brilliant. And I bought these shares and they did so well. I have like, I wish I could remember the numbers, but I don't. I just know that I, I made a lot of money. Unfortunately, the shares ended up getting delisted from the exchange, which means I needed to put them into a crypto wallet and I did not do my research, but it's fine. Put the shares into a crypto wallet. They were still worth a lot of money and I was still like really happy, but the withdrawal fees were, and that's where the anchorage bias came in. The withdrawal fees were incredibly high, but something like 30%. And because of that, I thought I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to withdraw the money. Like I can't be bothered to pay this fee jokes on me because i mean that's the anchorage bias i want to talk about but jokes on me because that share crashed and it is now worth zero rand and there is nothing to withdraw so there's that that was actually the worst um financial decision i've ever made (laughs) you know i'll just make the example if you think three four years back basically three years back prime rates were at seven percent and people completely and utterly anchor their decisions in that seven percent that's their most recent experience that's what they see they go shop around for property, they go to the banks, and the banks say, cool, given the 7%, you can get a loan of X amount. 
So their whole decision is anchored in an interest rate, which they unfortunately don't understand the consequences of. So once that rate increases from 7% to 10 or 11%, their bond amount suddenly goes up by 40%. They can't afford the property anymore. So, so it's, it's such a pervasive thing that people anchor their decisions on to buy property with a complete lack of what the consequences of that decision is. So one of the things that I've noticed about myself with respect to anchoring is that as my portfolio approaches round numbers, um, so sort of round numbers, so, you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, this sort of thing, right? Round numbers. I tend to get very conservative around those round numbers because I don't want to lose it, right? Like once you've attained that, call it a $100,000 portfolio, you don't ever want it to go back below that. So one of the things with respect to anchoring that I've noticed is that I take more risk when I have sort of odd numbers And then when I attain a sort of a significant milestone or a round number, I tend to crank back the risk because I never want to dip below that round number again. I think Daniel's anchor could be a bias all on its own. Now, I know it might feel like we're fighting a losing battle with so many biases influencing the decisions we're making all the time, but there are ways to combat biases. Being aware of them is the first battle. This is why I asked each of our guests what they think is the number one reason that people get into financial trouble. Let's hear what they have to say. Remember, awareness is powerful. Listen with an open mind. The number one reason that people get into financial trouble, I I would say, is because we're too present focused um, and we don't think about the long term. Oftentimes, um, we'll make decisions in our short term interest uh, that actually can harm us in the long term. Oh, there's trains happening. In 2013, it was a shopping spree gone wrong. In 2016, round about there, it was, ah, it was a weird year full of accidents and medical issues. And I don't know. Obviously, 2020, we know exactly what happened. And you do not speak to dead counselors about 2020, please. We still have post-traumatic stress because of that. Okay. Um, Now, 2021, 2022, we see the fallout of COVID. People got pay cuts, job losses, the debts they used to be able to afford too overwhelming now because they are working for smaller salaries. So while the employment rates is a bit better than it, what it was, those are not actual figures that you can rely on because at the end of the day, it's not taking into account what salary cuts they had while they gained new employment in the first place. A lack of knowledge and then also trading with too small capital. Those would be the big ones. If I had to pick, you know, in terms of number one and number two, um, financial knowledge and education is probably the biggest culprit because a lot of people get into trading. There's a there's the Dunning-Kruger bias where they think they can extrapolate their experiences and other vocations into trading. So being a successful uh, engineer or doctor makes you a successful trader, which is not the case. You need to learn the trade before you can apply it. Typically, f- financial trouble is like gaining weight. It doesn't happen overnight. It's the slow, additional, like let's say, less favorable decisions. It's eating that additional financial cookie, maybe dipping into some debt. And before you know it, you get to a point where, oh, hold on. I'm not making my payments. I need to make a change. And oftentimes when we have discussions with clients, they could feel really guilty of the decisions that they've made, but almost always did it make sense when it happened. So in our conversations, we try and firstly acknowledge that, yes, this is not a favorable position if you are in financial problems, but also to say your journey up to here, we can't change that. Let's work with the things that we can change and let's figure out How do we avoid these regrettable decisions in the future? If you're aware of the pitfalls and the biases, I firmly believe you can start changing your habits and make better decisions with your money. You just need to take the time to interrogate the information in front of you and your reason for wanting to make a particular decision. If you can do that, you can break the cycle. There is so much to cover in behavioral finance. We've only just scratched the surface here in season one. This is why in the next season, Yes, we're going to be doing a second season. 
we're going to be exploring even more biases. I've also got a few other topics I want to cover, including a favorite topic of mine, risk aversion versus loss aversion. I really hope that you've taken away some interesting insights and can start to practice how to recognize the influence of biases in your own decision making. Thank you so much for sticking with me through season one of Nudging Financial Behavior, brought to you by IG Market South Africa. If you liked the episode, please ensure you click the thumbs up button. And follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you know exactly when season two comes out. We'd also love some feedback from you, so please feel free to leave a comment or to get in touch with us. That was Nudging Financial Behavior, hosted by behavioral finance expert, Dr. Giselle Willows. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. You can catch the Nudging Financial Behavior podcast on YouTube, our blog, or your favorite podcast streaming platform. Thank you again to our sponsors, IG Market South Africa, for helping to bring the show to life. And now for the disclaimer. This podcast should not be seen as advice. All the information and opinions are the general nature. They are not intended to address the needs or circumstances of any individual. We are not financial advisors, neither are any of our staff or service providers, nor is our sponsor. All expressions of opinion by the host or guest are subject to change without notice in reaction to shifting market conditions. Any information you get from us should be seen as only that. Information only.